So if you think about astronomers, maybe you think uh, this is uh, what we uh, do or did. So um, uh, not really what, uh, what we do. Actually, this is more what we do. We, uh, we sit behind the screen, stare at the screen, and we're almost like programmers slash uh, data scientists. So um, this is kind of the data set that we had, which was so small that it's even printed in a PDF file. Like the, the tabular data, you can just like read it from a PDF file. Um, it's really small. It's like 100,000 stars, and that's all we had. That completely changed. So the Gaia mission, um, the, um, uh, it's, a, it's a satellite that scans the Milky Way for uh, the uh, positions, um, distances, and velocities of stars in the Milky Way. And it does this for um, a lot of stars. So we went from um, having like 100,000 stars, we went to uh, now something like 1.8 billion stars with 100 columns for, uh, for each star, so 100 features for each star. So we had to deal with a, a 10,000 times increase in data volume. And what we actually need to do our science is interactive exploration of this data, visualization, but also statistical analysis. Um, and the requirement, because we are like uh, uh, astronomers, is it has to be a, like a low barrier of entry. It has to be accessible, and money is also an uh, issue. So it, it has to be affordable. Um, so as I said, an easy setup, and that means uh, uh, preferably not a cluster. So if I take this previous data set that we had and just visualize the data in a simple way, so I'm, what I'm showing here is just uh, uh, sky coordinates of this data set. And you see here, you see two of our neighboring galaxies, um, large and small Magellanic Cloud, and you see we li live in a disky uh, uh, galaxy. Um, this gives you an idea what the sky coverage is. In this case, it's from a satellite, so we see all the stars. But uh, um, we, we have to deal with like 10,000 times, uh, 10, times as much data, so can we scale this up? So if we had like a million stars and we would do the same visualization, we would have this. If we had 10 million stars, we would have this. Going to 100 million stars, if you could actually plot it, would look like this. And if you were to plot the full catalog, you would see nothing. So that doesn't really work. So it's not only a, pr a problem of, of like the amount of data, but also how do you work with it. So instead, if we um, create like a simple aggregation. So what we do here is we calculate a histogram. So in each bin on the sky, we calculate how many stars there are and a, a color according uh, to how many stars are in this bin. So I do this now for this previous data set, and now we can see if we can still scale this up. So if we now use more data and we go to like 100 million, a billion, we actually, instead of like losing detail, we gain a lot of uh, uh, detail. So what we see here is again the LMC and the SMC are neighboring galaxies. We see in high details, you see dust features in the Milky Way. So this is really meaningful uh, to us. We also see stripes, so this is a quality control uh, issue. But kind of the, the point here is that you want a visualization like this, not a, just a scatter plot. So can we do this? Like, do we need a cluster for this? Uh, d does this, to make a visualization like this, do we need to run this overnight? Do we need to run this at lunchtime? Or can we do this interactively? So just to get a rough estimate of what's possible and what's not, let, let's do a back, on, a back of the envelope uh, calculation. So let's take a look at the memory use. So we're assuming double precision for the two columns we have. So it's eight bytes per value, two columns, and one billion rows. So if you multiply that, you get 15 gigabytes of data. Is that a lot? Well, if you look at the memory bandwidth of a uh, uh, older or more modern um, computer, it's actually doable to transfer this to the CPU in about a second. And I actually, if you have a fast SSD, like in this uh, laptop, uh, you can do this in a few seconds as well. So you can read this amount of data in just a few seconds. So memory and I.O. shouldn't be a limitation. So what about the CPU? So take one CPU, 4 gigahertz, something like this. But uh, you can, of course, have multiple cores. So in total, if you want to do this in, say, a second, what we call interactive, you would need be between uh, four or 100 cycles per row. 
So you cannot draw like complicated objects per star. You need to do something simple, like what I showed this this histogramming. So that that kind of culminated in the library uh, facts that uh, that I started creating to 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 try out this idea. We knew it was possible. Can we actually like make these these uh, visualizations or aggregations? So that uh, I created the library called Fex. So it's a high performance out of core data frame library. So that basically means you can work with data uh, data that's larger than RAM, um, and it works like on something like a billion samples on a single computer, for instance, this laptop, as we will demonstrate. It has a Pandas-like API uh, for familiarity, uh, uh, but it's not built on top of Pandas. It just feels like it. Uh, simple to install, just pip install, and you're ready to go. No like servers to set up or uh, services to start. And it's uh, open source. So I want to go a bit over the concept that, that actually enable us to get to this uh, this performance. So let's talk about memory mapping. So if you do a normal disk read, what is actually happening? So you first need to allocate a piece of memory. So you allocate, I don't know, 8 gigs of RAM. Then you need to read from disk into this buffer. But actually the operating system caches that. So it first goes into cache, and then it gets copied into your uh, private piece of memory, and then it gets transferred to the uh, CPU. So you're actually wasting memory, memory that cannot be like taken back by the operating system to do something else, and you're doing memory copying. Well, if you do memory mapping, and I'm not going to go into the details, but you basically you get a pointer to the same buffer that the operating system has. So you're not making a memory copy, and the operating system can just say like, hey, I'm out of memory, I'm just going to flush this cache, this piece of cache, and I will read it again if you need it. So you're basically outsourcing the complexities of what to read, what to cache to the operating system. And there are some more benefits. For instance, um, you basically have shared memory for all your processes. So if you run, for instance, a Python server, or you may be running Flask uh, or Dash using G-Unicorn, you have like 10 processes. Or you have a Jupyter Notebook, you have five kernels open with the same data set. They all share the same memory. So no memory explosions anymore. Uh, one downside is that you need to store it on disk as you would keep it in memory. You can get around that, but then you would need to make another, uh, you basically do a deserialization pass. Column-based storage, it's really important. So why? So maybe you've noticed, but we focus on analytical workloads. That basically means you're going to use a few columns and focus on these columns, calculate aggregation, statistics on that. And sequential access uh, is ideal for disks and uh, uh, RAM CPU. This reading is always block based, so you can just read a lot of blocks, should be uh, uh, really fast, and uh, it's uh, cache friendly. Uh, so we have support for a few file for, uh, formats, so we started with HDF5. Um, it's, um, it's a container format, so you can store anything in it, so the way we store it is, is our way of storing it. Uh, there's no standard on how you store tabular data set in uh, HDF5. But it's really simple. It's stored in a simple way. If I give you an HDF5 file and you just use an explorer, you'll probably find how you can access uh, the data. We also support Apache Arrow, which is specialized for tabular data. So it's really easy to, like if I give you an Arrow file, um, it will be, you can read it with R, uh, Java, uh, any, uh, any other language, and you know how to access the data. Um, all of these formats use like native storage, so it is on disk as it is on memory, which is ideal in combination with memory mapping. Um, so we also support uh, Parquet via Arrow, uh, so it's an industry standard, um, but it's not native. It's compressed, so you need have some uh, de deserialization, uh, so it's a bit slower compared to these other, if it as at least when it fits into uh, your operating system cache. Um, this Gaia dataset is one terabyte in size. So if we want to do filtering, like take a subset of that, uh, maybe a subset that is 90% of the data, we would we cannot make a copy of that. So to explain you like how we do not make copies, uh, let me give you this conceptual model of what a data frame is. Um, and it consists of data, so in this case uh, uh, two arrays, and a state. And now we're going to filter it. We're going to say, 
give me a new data frame that contains only the values where i a y is smaller than 10. So instead of copying the data, we simply store this expression in the state and we we find out how, how to uh, like give you only the data that you need. And the same for if you want to add a new column. So here I'm adding a new column Z, um, which is X plus Y times 10. So instead of eagerly computing this, uh, we just store the expression in a data frame. And that basically allows us to not take up any memory. Um, so then you have your data and you want to like compute on that, do aggregation. So we use, uh, use streaming algorithms, so we go in like one or maybe two passes over the data. Um, it is uh, basically a map mostly map reduced, so it's multi-threaded. Then you get into the issue of the uh, Python interpreter lock, uh, but because we use C++ under the hood, uh, you use basically use all the cores of your, uh, your machine. And I already talked a bit about the expression system, but let me go a bit bit more into detail uh, uh, of the expression system. So if you take two uh, columns and you multiply them together, you uh, eagerly compute the result and it takes memory, like in this example. In fact, if you multiply two columns, you build an expression, which is basically the mathematical formula that you, uh, uh, that that can give you the result. And if you print this out, we'll give you the first values and the last uh, values just to give you an idea of like, is this the right equation? Like what's going on? But um, this is not taking up any memory. It's just this string X times Y. And the power of this is like, this has more information than the, the output, right? We know what the equation is and we can optimize it. For instance, we can just in time compile this using uh, Numba, um, Python or if the GPU, GPU uh, uh, works with it, uh, we can actually uh, run this, uh, some of this on the GPU. So um, this was all happening in, in astronomy. Um, so both me and Jovan left astronomy and um, um, we now have a company. And we basically, we had this, we solved the problem in astronomy, but we realized that this, this is actually a broader problem and it can be applied to like, like many industry uh, uh, issues. So we continued with uh, uh, more features like fast string support was one of the f first things we did. Uh, uh, massive performance improvements there, group buys, join, ML integrations, etc. But basically what, what, what we want to like give you is like a tool to uncluster your data science. Probably you don't need a, c a cluster in many cases or at least postpone as, as long as possible. So um, I hope I convince you that facts can be fast, but uh, uh, I think it's it's also useful to show actually like live what you can do, and um, it's not wise, but uh, so that's why I uh, ask Jovan to do this. Uh, so Jovan, let's go ahead. Shall I switch? Yeah, please. Thanks, Martin. Hello everyone, can you see the screen behind me okay? Am I blocking part of it? Looks okay, good. good. Great, so Martin did a really good job explaining the concepts of X and how it works behind the scenes, but we thought it would be a really good idea to just show you like how it works in practice instead of just showing you like a bunch of numbers, it runs in a second and so on. So here, we're gonna go over a little demo of how it works in practice with, with a bit of a more kind of everyday data set that we found available online. So this is a Jupyter Notebook. This is going to be available after the talk, so you can uh, like play around and experiment with both the data set and notebook on your own computer to convince yourself that this is uh, like legit, basically. So let's import the, the libraries. So for this demo, we're using this uh, New York taxi data set. It has a bunch of information regarding taxi trips in New York City. And uh, we have some versions of it, but you see they're generally quite big. And uh, today we're going to use this file that's basically 110 almost gigabytes on disk. And this computer has, what, uh, 16 or 32 gigabytes of RAM, so using standard techniques, it's definitely not possible to even open it. But with VEX and the power of memory mapping, this actually is like instantaneous. So now it's open. You don't believe me? Let's access the data. Here it is. You see on the, your left that it has over a billion rows. 
and I can access it again and again and again, and it's instantaneous. And this is the power of membrane mapping, basically. We know exactly how the data looks on disk, we know where it is, and we know exactly what to read. And here we're not, we don't really need to read everything, we just need to give you a little preview. So the first five rows and the last five rows, and all of the columns. So that's instantaneous, any laptop can do it. No need to have fancy memory uh, requirements. And we have access to some metadata, let's say the data types. It's very simple to, to do. If you're familiar with pandas or pandas-like data frames, it should, you should feel right at home. The next of the core concepts that Martin explained is shallow copies. So let's say we want to explore with this data a bit, and there are some meaningful columns like pickup locations, date time, how many passengers in a taxi, but there are also some maybe not that useful columns for the first pass when we explore this data, like some taxes, some columns with unclear names with lots of missing values, so we don't really want to kind of overburden ourselves. We want to filter that out and only focus on the columns we want. So we have a list of columns that we want to keep, and just uh, basically making a copy of this is a shallow copy, meaning that we're only going to focus on this, on this uh, parts of the data that we want. We're not actually making a separate copy, but just referencing the data that's relevant to us. Again, no extra memory usage, just pointing the operating system to like focus, focus on this in particular, the rest doesn't matter. We can also, instead of accessing the, the full data frame, access particular columns, or we call them expressions just like you would do in Pandas, for example, super fast. Again, we know exactly where they are on disk. We can read it immediately. We just give a preview. It doesn't matter if it's 1 billion, 10 billion, 100 billion. It's all the same. And the fun part starts when we try to actually do some mathematics or arithmetic. So as Martin explained, if we have a simple arithmetic operation like this, what we get is a preview of the expression. We don't, at this point, we don't really need to evaluate everything. We just want to make a preview to make sure that our operation makes sense. And this is one of the core of the VEX and how it, how it actually looks like. So this expression, we can assign it to a data frame, just like you would normally do. Here it is. We get a simple preview and we get it at the end, just as a normal column, like the rest of it. So there actually this, there is no physical data behind it. We're just storing the equation but the data frame doesn't know this. So when you need it, you evaluate it on the fly. When you don't need it, it just stored as an expression, takes zero memory. So, okay, that's great. How about we do some aggregations? Now when we do an aggregation, which is something like computing the count, the mean standard deviation, and so on, we cannot get away, away with just doing lazy, right? We have to actually compute the expression. So we have a billion columns, and this is how long it takes. And this is, well, maybe it may sound quite fast, but it's actually, like the first time it's a bit slow, the, third, the, it needs, the operating system needs to like, figure it out where the data is coming from. The second time it's much faster. Oh, but there is an N. This is kind of okay. We divide by zero somewhere, so we can just filter it out. Let's filter distances that are well, bigger than zero. And this is how long it takes to do simple operations with VEX on like over a billion columns, like basically real time. And uh, you can at this point say, yeah, this is great, but it's like super simple operation, right? Just some mean that's like streaming algorithms have been doing it for a while. So, okay, let's try something more challenging. We have this fancy expression, basically calculating the distance between two points in a sphere. Uh, it's lots of trigonometry, like uh, arithmetics. It's, it's quite computationally expensive. So let's try it out. Without any special magic, out of the box, VEX will use NumPy to do this calculation. And yeah, it's a bit slow because it does, well, you can maybe hear <laughs> the laptop trying to work. So it's fully parallelized. It's going to use all the cores available. And yeah, I mean, um, I would like to know what you think after the talk, whether this is impressive or not. We're doing 1.1 billion points in about 30 seconds for some really, really challenging computation. But you may think, yeah, but I want to go faster. Then you can actually. So we support just-in-time computation. If you happen to have a GPU, you can actually use CUDA to pre-compile it to CUDA. Otherwise, you can use things like Numba and Pytran to pre-compile it. And now it's basically going to cut your, cut your runtime uh, in half. So even for complicated expressions, you can evaluate them like on a simple off-the-shelf laptop, basically nearly in real time. And uh, we're done. But where VEX really shines, what it was originally built for, is to create uh, basically aggregations. So let's demonstrate this. So the simplest aggregation, what we call zero dimensions, is just a single statistics. We already did this. It's um, 
well, something like count or mean. And this basically gives us the, the one, uh, one second or less uh, per run, especially when the operating system knows where to look at. So we can uh, execute this again and again. We get the result nearly immediately. But this count method that's a property of this data frame is, is kind of fancy because we think, OK, count maybe sounds kind of silly and, 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 and simple, but it's actually the foundation of many of the statistical methods. If you think about mean, star deviation, skew, all other fancy metrics, they're basically underneath, like deep down, they're just counting. So instead of counting a single expression, we can say, OK, we want to count, but we want to bin bias expression. So basically, we can build a histogram and say, along this expression, count how many samples you get in a particular bin. And this is basically a foundation of a histogram that we can plot with your favorite, uh, favorite plotting library. And of course, VEX has uh, friendly APIs to do this in one step, but this is just to illustrate. We can extend this to n dimensions. So for example, two dimensions, I can choose, let's say, pickup location and uh, well, longitude and latitude. And uh, now it's going to bin by two dimensions, effectively creating a heat map that I can visualize again currently with Matplotlib, but you can just use whatever, uh, whatever you're comfortable with. So this is the basics. And from here, we can basically uh, use it to build fancy visualizations, work interactively with data, and well, just do data science. For the next part, actually, I would like us to go together through this data set and just uh, like simulate how a simple first pass exploration would look like, especially if you have like a billion points or something. So in this data set, there is a column called passenger count. And this is maybe my favorite, <laughs> my favorite method, value counts. Probably if you know pandas, you know what it is. You get, for each individual unique uh, sample, you know how many entries there are in your data frame. So here we can see it's kind of dirty. There, well, in a typical tax, you expect to have maybe four or five people most. But here you see there's like lots of erroneous data, maybe, maybe some, something wrong. And there is also like lots of passengers, lots of trips like zero. So we just want to like filter it. But um, if we execute this again, maybe you, when you're a data scientist, you do this interactively because uh, the operating system has cached part of the data, like the second and third time, it's much faster. So OK, let's filter this out. Simple filter, passengers like less than, less than seven, more than zero. We don't want them to trips. Let's, let's do another example, let's say, with, uh, with the distance average uh, typical distance that a taxi uh, does. So this is another value counts method, and I do it again because I want to show you a case with like much higher cardinality because this is like just distances. And you see it's, again, quite fast, couple of seconds, billion points, laptop uh, kind of thing. This is interesting. I guess you can see what the common distances are. I guess New York is kind of a grid, so you expect the same things to happen again and again. Interesting thing, lots of taxi trips with, where is it? With zero distance, that's kind of funny. We probably want to clean it, but let's look at the distribution. So we can plot a histogram. Again, quite fast. Weird histogram, first of all, negative distances, something's very wrong. And a very massive tail on the, on the positive side. So we can, uh, just for fun, explore this. And if we find what the maximum distance is, if we believe this at face value, it's like, wow, almost <laughs> six times the distance to the moon. So this has to be cleaned. So let's do some more sensible histogram, simple range. OK, this maybe sounds more believable. And we can filter this out. So you might be thinking, like, or at least I was thinking, wow, some simple columns, crazy outliers. What, what, about, uh, what about the actual pickup and drop-off locations? Because that really defines what New York City is. And now we're kind of going in two dimensions. How do you cross-filter this? Well, because we really. Uh, care about kind of interactivity and, uh, and like interactive exploration for data scientists, we actually have this widget out of the box for you to explore uh, basically heat maps interactively. So it takes a bit to start because of the JavaScript things. And uh, this is basically a map of New York City as traced by the pickup locations. Well, it's dominated by outliers, so it doesn't, like you don't see much, but we can zoom in, zoom into this red spot. And this happens in real time, actually. I'm just not very good at zooming. So every time I stop scrolling, this basically to the histogram, the count method recomputes with new limits. And we can see New York City here. And you can zoom in, zoom in out, 
I have never been to New York City, so I don't know like what things are, wh which places are interesting to look at. But basically, yeah, you can uh, <laughs> you can uh, interactively focus on the area that you like the most, or just find like which area is basically your definition of New York City, without uh, well needing any fancy equipment or any like well many lines of code basically. So let's say we've, dis we've agreed on what our bounding box is. Again, simple filter, and um, and uh, we can continue with this with this uh, process a bit more. I've included some more cells exploring different features like trip velocity, like fares, and so on. This is going to be all on GitHub available to you as, uh, along with the data, so I'll just not, not bore you with the same things again and again, but I welcome you to try to explore it and just see how it works. But I would like to focus on some interesting features um, that VEX has. So let's extract um, from the pickup hour, from the pickup date time, like the hour and uh, day and month, and what VEX can do, we can say, okay, I want to treat certain features as basically as categories. And that will allow us to, when visualizing them, instead of treating them as numbers and just do normal binning, VEX will know, like, oh, this is a category. So each category gets its own bin, and then I can count. And uh, this is quite convenient for doing plots like this, for example. Now we've marked the pickup hour and day of week as categorical. So when we do make a histogram, or a two-dimensional histogram, it's a heat map, it will count each individual category as a bin. So then we can count how many trips there are in each combination of day and, uh, and hour of the day. And this kind of makes sense. So the blue is low number and red is high number. Early in the morning, not many trips. Around 9 o'clock in the morning, a bit more, people kind of go to work. The absolute peak happens is here at the very end of the day, Friday night, Saturday night, uh, where I guess most people take, take taxis after their, their night out. So super easy to make. Again, billion points took 12 seconds, which is double the time because it's a demo, so the laptop is nervous. Um, so this has been like kind of binning two-dimensional. We do a conventional group by. I'm just going to show it uh, for posterity. But there is a very cool feature here that I want to show you. So usually, kind of if you're familiar with Pandas or SQL, kind of similar in, in concept, you bin by something, you group by something, and then you do an aggregation. But sometimes you're like, OK, I want to do an aggregation. And in this case, I want to do an aggregation with an additional filter. So think about it. If you need to do this in Pandas, you would have, OK, my first aggregation is one data frame. If I want to do a filter, I need to filter out my data frame, do an aggregation, and do, and do a join. In VEX, we allow you to have a filter on per aggregation basis. So you can have, let's say, the tip amount for the whole data, the average, and then a tip amount but according to some filter that says, OK, I just want for trips that had two passengers, like a couple, and want to compare maybe the, those tip more or differently than the rest. Then you can plot this favorite plotting library and say, OK, they're kind of the same, some variations. But yeah, the idea is that you can do more with less, line of codes, less lines of code. Again, we can have join standard operation, just big data, small laptop kind of thing. Um, now we're joining the original data frame that we just discussed with this group uh, group by data frame that we that we did. Takes a bit of time, but yeah, here it is. And if you scroll to the right, you get the new columns that we that we just added. So just before I wrap things up, maybe you're inspired, like, wow, taxis are cool. Maybe I can have a side castle. But where what where should I start if I like, <laughs> want to like, have a side castle? OK, first, uh, we can do another one of our favorite heat maps, just uh, see okay, what, which locations are, are great for, for picking up passengers. Just like a nor normal heat map would do, right? OK, so Manhattan, pretty popular place. This, can you see my pointer? Yep. This is one of the airports, another airport, popular place. But maybe you're thinking, OK, yeah, quantity, like quality over quantity. I don't care about number of passengers. I care how much money I earn. So instead of just plotting counts, we can actually tell VEX what to plot, which is why this keyword argument is called what. Um, and uh, instead of just counting, now we can say we want for each little bin, we want the mean of the fair amount, so like how much, how much money a uh, taxi driver is earning on average. And uh, we get a little bit of a different map. See, these avenues are very popular. Charging, taxi people charge a lot. And of course, the um, 
well, the airports and some, some docks or whatever this area is. But if you think about it, maybe the raw amount is not always a good indicator. You have costs, maybe you need to go to a remote location and you have to need, need to drive back, waste time, waste petrol. Um, so yeah, and maybe a better metric is to actually use this expression we evaluated earlier. So fare divided by distance, it's kind of like normalizing your costs. And with this, we can, uh, we can get slightly different picture. And I guess my main point behind showing you all these slightly different versions of each other is just to show you how fast things are. And you can like, almost forget that you're working with a 100 gigabyte file. And yeah, here, here is like maybe what you would actually be interested in if you're running a taxi company. Get a slightly different picture now. You see like, OK, this airport kind of disappeared, which is makes sense. Fixed price, no matter where you go. And Manhattan is, is uh, like where you would go if you want to pick the lucrative passengers. So just to wrap things up, uh, nice little feature. We know VEX is made to work with big data sets, but sometimes like data storage hard drives on laptops can come in premium. So actually VEX works really well with cloud. So you can put your data, HDF5, Parquet, Aero, on a public cloud like S3, Google Cloud, your favorite public cloud. And you can open it straight away from it. And what VEX will do, it will connect to your cloud and uh, stream the data and cache it directly, directly to, the lap to your laptop. So again, this is, uh, well, it doesn't take very long because we're only accessing part of it. We don't need full, the full data. But if, if we needed the full data, it will first download the full data, only the part of what we need. So in this particular case, just a single column and uh, evaluate that. In this case, it's quite fast because we already have it cached uh, from our previ previous executions. Oh, so in a nutshell, that's how it looks and feels to use VEX. Pandas-like, but hopefully faster, and hopefully it will, you'll find it uh, useful. So thanks, and back to you, Martin. Thank you, uh, Jovan. So um, I forgot to mention this is my lucky slide and it worked again. I think uh, that uh, that's nice. So um, so Jovan showed you how to use it for like data exploration. But what we see a lot is that people want to move like putting it into production. And, and what do I mean by that? So um, uh, what what we see a lot is people making dashboards. So they, they start with large data sets, start exploring it, um, and then they want to make a dashboard. Uh, also, web APIs uh, or deploying ML models. And we think FEX is also like really ideal there. So what, what I told you about this uh, memory mapping of, um, uh, is that you share data with like G-Unicorn, like multiple processes that you have a lot in Python. Uh, you're not wasting uh, any uh, memory. Something we didn't talk about, but also like, uh, for instance, like if you have a dashboard, the first page is always the same. So it's the same query. So using a caching system, we can accelerate a lot of the like common queries. Um, and it's well tested with these uh, frameworks. Like we test it, we use it a lot, a lot with uh, uh, Dash, Flask, and uh, Fast API. And if you like deploy, uh, deploy this in the cloud, you don't have to worry about like how do I get the data on my node. You just have an S3 URL, and you still get like really good performance because we we do cache it lazily on the machine you're using. Um, so actually, FEX consists of like lots of sub-packages, and we do that so you don't have so much dependencies. So uh, uh, what we show you, most of it is uh, is FEX core. We have FEX ML for uh, machine learning things, and uh, Jovan was doing the visualizations with uh, FEX uh, FEX Fizz. Um, but it's basically like matplotlib is not a dependency of FEX core. So if you just run something that just compute and doesn't do visualization, you of course don't want to have uh, have to install matplotlib. So it's being used in the wild. So um, uh, we work with Bioscribe and accelerating like uh, their uh, visualization of a genomics uh, um, um, dashboard with a uh, quite decent performance increase, I would say. We work with the Space Telescope on, on uh, something I didn't talk about, like remote data frames. So actually, you have a local Python object, but it actually queries the data remotely. And we work closely with Plotly and uh, helping them uh, with uh, uh, a product that just launched a uh, dashboard engine uh, where uh, FEX is the default backend to do the, uh, the computations. Um, just to give you an example of, uh, of, of 
that you can really like build such a dashboard. We wrote an article and a, so let me refresh this. Um, so you can go to this URL. If you can read it, it's dash.fax.io. Um, and there's a link here to the article explaining like how we built this. But this is basically processing, uh, in this case, uh, 120 million rows. So it's a li not a billion because you, uh, we expect like multiple users. So you want to have like really fast interaction if you have uh, like multiple users. So, and just to show that it's more than heat maps. So with aggregations and some fantasy, you can create like these maps where you click. So I can click on a particular region and get statistics on this particular um this particular um, uh, borough it's called so i can for instance click on jfk airport and see from this sunburst diagram where everybody's going or this sink di diagram um, so actually let me move to the trip plan and maybe you want to like uh, go from this area to this area and see how much does it take and how much does it cost so we have an overview of like how much in general this cost how long it takes but maybe you're worried like okay i'm a return i need to go there on a wednesday particular hour you can filter so this is all interactive nothing pre-computed all done on the fly just to show you that this this is uh, this is possible so um also, Joven and I need to eat, so uh, we have this company, and uh, so it's, we're not just doing like open source development. We we help with like uh, companies that need particular features for like developing uh, those or speeding those those up with support retainers. So we're on like speed dial, helping with performance and and training, and and uh, um, we hope to like flow that back uh, that uh, uh, back to the uh, the open source uh, development, so we can continue to support and maintain uh, maintain facts. So uh, I want to end with a summary. So I hope I convince you that, that operating on something like one billion rows in one second is possible, on this laptop even. Um, so I explained how we do this and we use uh, some techniques, memory mapping, column-based storage for, ID, uh, uh, for uh, sequential access, fast sequential access, multi-threading and C++ to avoid the uh, Python interpreter uh, lock and the expression system uh not to waste memory basically and i think we showed you it's ideal for interactive exploration like in the jupyter notebook but also for building backends especially uh, dashboards and uh basically the takeaway is that may maybe you don't need a, uh, a cluster um, you can get in touch with us um, there are also the last link is a link to the uh, uh it's not up yet we'll push this tonight the uh the notebook and the slides um, and don't forget to vote for this, uh, this session. Thank you.